This is part three of topic four in Materials Engineering Mate 210. Today we're going to be talking about the plastic behavior that we just described in topic two, strength and ductility, in terms of what's going on inside the material. Specifically, we'll be looking at the crystal structure of materials and how those crystal structures have defects called dislocations. And more importantly, how those dislocations can move within the material on what are called slip systems. So you can think of dislocations as little cars inside the crystal structure and those cars are moving along highways called slip systems. Together as the cars move along the highways we get the phenomenon called plastic deformation. We'll talk about how this is what really happens and how for a long time people thought it happened differently but that proved to be inaccurate. Let's get started. Well, first of all, let's talk about the wrong theory. This was called false glide theory. And it was the idea that if I broke all the bonds along one plane, as this demonstration shows, I can move the crystal or slip the crystal from one position to another. Let me play that video for you again so you can see it working. The theory assumes what is now called false glide mechanism where all the atomic bonds along this plane are broken simultaneously. But there's two problems with this. Number one, if I have to break all the bonds simultaneously, that would require an enormous amount of energy. In fact, it requires so much energy that the theoretical prediction said that metals should be about a thousand times stronger than they really are. So that couldn't make any sense. And secondly, if I break all the bonds along this plane at the same time, then wouldn't I actually fracture the material and break it into two pieces possibly? And that didn't happen either. So the false glide theory really doesn't explain what happens in the real world. So we need to, what we call a better mechanism. By the way, the word mechanism means anything that happens inside the material that we can describe with a theory. Well, before we talk about that better mechanism, let's take a look at what are called linear defects, or also known as dislocations. Dislocations are one-dimensional defects. In other words, they're lines of atoms that are in the wrong place at the wrong time. And what's happened is the crystal has been sheared one lattice parameter or one unit cell to create an extra plane of atoms that shouldn't be there. Now these dislocations are very important defects because they allow the crystal planes to move relative to one another within a metal crystal. We find defects in metals all the time but we don't find them in polymers very often and almost never find them in ceramic materials. And the reason for that is that those crystals are far more complicated and involve more atoms of different types. So it's difficult for defects like dislocations to move around or even be formed in the first place. So that's lesson number one about dislocations. They tend to prefer simple crystal structures and thankfully for us metals have the simplest crystal structures like BCC and FCC. And these dislocations are also very very tiny. This is a picture of dislocations taken by what is called a transmission electron microscope. And the magnification that you're seeing here is about one million times. That's pretty powerful. These dislocations are in the order of hundreds of atoms long. There might be a hundred or two hundred atoms from the tip of this dislocation to its end at the other side. You can also see how dislocations run into each other and create what's called a dislocation network. They're not lined up perfectly with one another. Let me see if this video will play for us. Yeah, here we go. So this video shows what happens to dislocations as we apply a stress field to the material. You can see in this transmission electron microscope image the dislocation traveling through the material as we plastically deform that piece of metal. Let's play that again so you can see it one more time. So this is important lesson number two about dislocations. Dislocations can move and they move generally perpendicular to the line of the dislocation. That's very important as we'll see later on. Okay, back to the lecture. So what's a better mechanism? Well, the better mechanism is called true glide. Here's how true glide works. We're going to introduce a dislocation into this perfect crystal. You'll see that appear as red when I play the video. 
Now what I want you to do is watch how that defect or mistake in the crystal moves from the left of the crystal to the right of the crystal as we apply shear stress. It's the defect that's moving, by the way, not the atoms. You'll, if you watch the atoms carefully, they're moving very short distances. But the defect moves completely from the left side of the crystal to the right side of the crystal. Let me play the video for you so you can see it happening. There's the dislocation, and you can see how the dislocation is moving, but the atoms themselves are moving very short distances at all. Here it is one more time. We can see the same phenomenon in what is called a bubble raft. A bubble raft is simply two pieces of glass with lots of soap bubbles in between the two pieces of glass. When I move the bubbles or compress them and then stretch them, we'll actually see dislocations traveling through the bubbles as if it was an array of atoms. Let's see if we can play that video and watch it happen. So here we are, we're compressing the atoms and you'll see this atoms start to pop not not the bubbles popping themselves but you'll see the dislocations moving through the material there's a good one coming up here pretty soon there it goes right down there there's another one traveling along there that's how we plastically deform atoms in the crystalline structure we don't change the shape of the atoms they're still spheres we can't change their shape but we can shift their position within the crystal by having these dislocations move through the material. In fact, if you look closely, you can see there's a dislocation sitting right here, an extra plane of atoms that doesn't belong. And you can see how the other plane of atoms have bent around to allow that plane of atoms to exist. Well, that kind of dislocation is called an edge dislocation, and it's the most common type. There are other types of dislocations as well, but that's beyond the scope of this class. The important thing is that that edge dislocation is an extra half plane of atoms that occupies a space between the normal planes of atoms that, that would normally exist. So that extra half plane is a defect and it raises the energy of the system. But if it weren't for that defect, we would have no way of placidly deforming the metal. So why dislocations exactly? Why is it easier? Well, for that we need our friend Goldie the Glowworm. Now Goldie over here Pretend that her legs are the bonds between one plane of atoms represented by her body and another plane of atoms represented by the ground. Now what we could do is false glide, and in false glide we simply pull on Goldie until she breaks all of her bonds at one time, moves all of her legs at one point over here, and you can see how disheveled and Goldie is. That doesn't make a lot of sense. But on the other hand, what we could do is give Goldie a swift kick in the butt and get her to lift her legs up. Now when she lifts one leg up, that's the same as having a half diso uh, edge dislocation. Excuse me. And Goldie can easily move that edge dislocation one step at a time until eventually she moves one lattice position over to the right. And notice how much happier Goldie is about that. You can uh, do something similar with carpet. If you've ever tried to move a large rug, you'll notice that it's incredibly heavy and there's a lot of friction between the floor and the rug, making it difficult to move. But if you create a small bump in the rug and kick that bump along, you can move the rug small distances with very little effort. That's the same thing as a dislocation moving through a metal. Now here's two videos that I'd like you to watch to see how dislocations appear on the surface of the metal. This is a piece of copper being pulled in an electron microscope and you can see all the bands of dislocations that are popping onto the surface of that crystal as it's plastically deformed. Now the reason they appear white is because there are small steps where the crystal is now sheared one lattice parameter above the surface below it. I'll play it one more time. See the dislocations popping out? Also notice that all the dislocations are parallel to each other. Now that's important. What that means is that the dislocations are moving on parallel planes within the crystal structure. Why parallel planes? Well, the answer is because some planes, some orientations within the crystal are easier to move along than others. We call these the slip planes. So it's as if you had a lot of different highways within the crystal, but some highways were easier to travel on than others. So the dislocations choose to travel on those slip planes. Now here's a picture of what the deformation looks like 
as we seriously plastically deform it. And you can see the slip occurring along these slip lines. The dislocations are traveling along those slip lines within the material. It almost looks like the metal is flowing. It's so in incredibly ductile. Now, that was deformation in a single crystal, where all the atoms are lined up along a similar orientation. But what if I have grains with grain boundaries? What happens differently then? Well, the difference is that the slip lines don't always line up from one grain to the next because the crystal orientation is different. So, for example, here we have a very large grain in brass, and you can see that the dislocations are traveling along these slip lines or slip planes in the brass until you get to a grain boundary, and then the orientation of the slip planes changes. Now, that's a really important phenomenon, and we can use that to our advantage, as we'll see later on. But for right now, what's important to recognize is that some grains will plastically deform a lot, and other grains won't plastically deform very much at all. And it just depends on their orientation relative to the way we're applying the outside stress field. The other thing that happens in polycrystalline materials when we deform them is that the grains change shape. As the plastic deformation occurs within any one grain, that grain elongates in the direction of the applied stress. So here's a picture of what are called equiaxed grains, where all the grains are approximately the same dimension in all axes, or they're approximately round. But as I deform that material, you'll notice that the grains stretch out and become elongated. These are what are now called elongated, or columnar grains. Now this is really important because if I, for example, have a crack, and that crack were to be along the direction of those elongated grains, it would have a very easy time just traveling along the grain boundaries with almost nothing to stop it. But if a crack appears in this direction, where the cursor is, the crack would have to travel a much more tortuous path in order to follow the grain boundaries, therefore making it much more difficult for the crack to travel through the material. Now this was important to Daimler Chrysler Benz many years ago, when they had a tension strut, part of your car suspension, that the grain flow was in the wrong direction, and the tension struts actually snapped on the assembly plant floor. They had to shut down the assembly plant for over a week, and it cost about a million dollars.